All right. Good morning, everybody. Please have a seat. Welcome our campus over at Lone Hill and over at Etiwana Gardens, if you would. Just raise your hands. Let them know that you know they're with us. One church, many locations. Uh, we're in a series called 24, and the series is based on the last 24 hours of the life of Jesus as we work our way toward Easter and have this uh, magnificent uh, weekend service where people uh, who are hopefully far from God will come near to God. And as we start, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew 26 verses 47 through 54. And as you're turning there, a question for you. Have you ever had in your life a crisis of faith? Has there ever been a time in your life when you perhaps thought all this stuff about Christianity is kind of like myth or legend and it doesn't, I mean, it feels good. It makes you feel good about purpose and meaning and destiny in life. But at the end of the day, you kind of began to wonder if it's reflective of what is real reality. And usually when you go through a time of crisis of faith, it has very little to do with empirical evidence. It's not like something you read in National Geographic and you think, oh, they found something. Oh, this must not be true. It's more associated with some propositional truth that you've believed about God all your life, and then an existential reality takes place in your life. You experience something that you cannot harmonize well with what you believed about God in the past. So you believe that if you did everything right, married the right person, and you tried to build your marriage on biblical principles and it failed, then you're starting to wonder, wait a minute, I did everything right and it still failed, so this God thing must not be true. Or you raised your kids the way that you thought you should raise them, you read scripture to them and they still walked away from God and now their life is a mess. So you're thinking, okay, wait a minute, if, if it's true that I, I live my life by these principles in raising my kids and, and I still have no guarantee, then this God stuff must not be true. I've done everything God asked me to do in relation to my finances and still I'm in this hole that I can't seem to be able to dig myself out of. So it's something that you experience, it's an existential reality in your life that you cannot harmonize with some propositional truth that you've believed about God in the past. Something happens. Now, most of the time it's because your understanding of the kingdom of God is skewed somewhat. And when your understanding of the kingdom of God isn't what it ought to be, then life experiences are going to try you a little bit. and They're going to cause tension. That's exactly what happens to Peter when he comes into the garden and Judas comes to betray Jesus with a kiss in Matthew 26. And then the Bible tells us in verses 51 and 52 that after Judas says, greetings, rabbi, and kisses him, Jesus replies, do what you came for, friend. And then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions, now we know who this is, it's Peter, reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, what would make Peter, having been around Jesus all these years, take a dagger out and chop another guy's ear off? Well, just for a moment in time, Peter forgets what the kingdom of God is truly about. I think he has good days and bad days. A good day is when he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, as he did over in Caesarea Philippi. A bad day is when he says, you know what, I think I'll grab my knife and cut this guy's ear off. <laughs> Jesus responds by saying, Put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Now, if you're Peter, Peter's probably thinking, why don't you? If you've got access to 12 legions of angels, sounds like a pretty good idea to me right now. Your kingdom is about to come to an end. So if there's some secret weapon that you have we don't know about, now would be a good time to deploy it. It's Peter's way of saying to Jesus, man, our hopes and dreams are crashing down. You can't let them kill you. I mean, we can't sit on your right and on your left in your kingdom if you have no kingdom. So do something. Do something. If you have all this power, Jesus, that you've demonstrated, stop this thing. Does that sound like any episode in your life? If you have all this power, then stop this thing. 
That's what New Zealanders were asking. Most of you know, I just got back from a trip, and I don't think it was by chance or accident that I was in New Zealand at the time of the shootings. Uh, they brought me into the radio station, and they would take me from one frequency, one radio station to the next to try to address these issues. But New Zealand's in total shock right now. A man walks into a mosque, and he cavalierly murders 50 people who are in the midst of prayers, injuring 50 more. And the whole thing was so surreal. Literally, folks, this Australian gunman puts a camera on his helmet and broadcast live over the World Wide Web that you could see as it's happening in real time, talking to himself, talking about how it's going to be a good day because he knows there's going to be a lot of people in the mosque praying, so there'd be more targets. And you watch him lock and load these weapons in his car. You're seeing this in real time. And he walks into the mosque, and it's like it's, it's not real, but it is real. And he just starts shooting, emptying out his semi-automatic automatic weapons. And there's no discretion. He just kills. He doesn't ask, oh, maybe this is a kid or maybe this is an elderly person. Or There's no specific target. Everybody's a target. And what really made it heinous, especially heinous, is after he had done that, he goes back out to the car. You see this live on the web. And he, uh, he reloads and goes back in and shoots everybody again, even though they're dead, just to make sure that nobody escapes. The attacks began at what they call Al Noor Mosque in the suburb of uh, Rickerton around 140, and it continued in what is known as the Linwood Islamic Center at about 155. He uses two semi-automatic rifles, two shotguns, one lever action rifle, and there were undetonated car bombs found in his car. Now, New Zealand was absolutely stunned. And it's the first time in New Zealand's history that the terrorism level was raised to high. In fact, I lived in New Zealand for 10 years, and policemen do not carry weapons in New Zealand. Now, they have access to them in the back of their cars, but they do not carry them on their persons. But the next day after this, for the first time, I was walking back from a breakfast meeting in Auckland, and I happened to pass by a mosque. I didn't do it on purpose. It's just the route we took. And there were armed New Zealand policemen. I'd never seen that in New Zealand. They had full automatic weapons. And they did that. They presented themselves at every mosque around New Zealand for fear of another attack. Prime Minister Arden did not know how to respond to all this. Now, I want you to follow me here because I lived in New Zealand because I'm very familiar with culture. I saw John Campbell, who read the news for TV3 for over 30 years. He's a New Zealand icon. I never have seen him so distraught as he was reporting on the scene. And the, the phrase he kept repeating over and over was this, what then will save us? What then will save us? Now, if you don't know anything about history of New Zealand, you're, you're going to think, what are you talking about? But you have to understand, New Zealand is a very, and I say this with love, arrogant society. It truly believes that, if, that, you, that the, the measure of man is all things and that man is basically good. And if you can create a society uh, whereby men can flourish, then no evil will occur. They are an extreme form of socialism. And they truly believe that you can create a certain type of society where bad things will not happen. So the reason John Campbell is so shocked is New Zealanders really believe they've created a society where this type of thing will never happen, but it just did. So they're trying to ask questions about why and how can they prevent it when they don't possess a worldview that can give them the answers to the questions they're asking. The Muslims who were living in Christchurch are mostly Muslims who have escaped from war-torn places like Syria or Afghanistan in search of a quiet and peaceable life. And the New Zealand uh, officials promised them that they could come here and have a peaceful life. And then this happens. And so I watched as the media, in desperation, began to ask questions to make sense of everything. Who was the guy that committed this? Why would one of ours do this? How could he maliciously and callously do such a thing? Now, let me go back again. Listen, please. This is so important. And I do this because it is important. 
as you go out into the world to have these conversations that you are equipped to do it. It's not good enough that you've set up a meeting with Pastor Jeff. You've got to do it. You've got to be an ambassador to the message of Christ. The reason that New Zealand is so frustrated and in shock right now, you say, well, of course they're in shock. People have died. Yes, but other than that is because they do not possess a worldview that can answer the toughest questions of their lives. You know, there's an old joke. I think my father told me this when I was a little boy about the guy who lost some money out of his pocket and he's looking under a lamppost. Another guy comes by and says, hey, what's wrong? He said, well, I lost some money. Where did you lose the money? I lost it over there in the dark. Well, why are you looking under the lamppost? Because I can't see over there. That's an old joke. That's New Zealand. They're looking for the answers to these questions in places where they can see, but the answers lie in places they cannot see. And the reason is New Zealand, first of all, possesses a purely and totally secularistic culture. They laugh at all religion. They tolerate it, okay, but they laugh at it and say that it is for the weak-willed and weak intellectual. I coach basketball at Rangitoto High School, which is a major high school on the north shore of Auckland, and I have never been around a culture that was so anti-God, not just apathetic, but anti-God. The teachers told the students blatantly, don't fall for this. There is no God. You are alone in this world. You are what you are. And the belief in God or religion is something for the weak-willed or the weak intellectual. Now, isn't it interesting that New Zealand has the highest teenage suicide rate in the world? Do you think they could possibly be connected? So what do you tell a student when he's flunking classes or when you go through adolescent struggles or the death of a student? Don't be fooled, they said. Don't be led astray by those who are God botherers, who bother you with God. Well, the Christian is not the only worldview that must give an answer to the evil, pain, and suffering in the world. And at the core of atheism, how does atheism, a no-God society, respond to the death and murders of people? There's only one response. Bad luck. Atheistic evolution is about the survival of the fittest. They obviously weren't fit, so they're not surviving. It's just nature's way of strengthening the gene pool. Now, how would you like to be told that after you've lost somebody close to you? Richard Dawkins, the guru of atheism, his response would be something like this. There was something about the genetic makeup of the shooter that gave him no real choice but to do what he did. And there is no rhyme or reason. It just is. Now, if that is your ultimate worldview, then when something like this occurs, you're going to start asking questions that undermine your own mind. You're going to ask questions like, why? Well, hold on a second. You, in an atheistic worldview, you can't ask the question why, because there is no reason in an atheistic world. That's only a question you can ask in theism. There is no purpose or meaning or anything about anything, if you are a result of time plus matter plus chance, if there's no God, there's no rhyme or reason to anything that happens in your life, and you have no hope of anything getting better. You can't borrow Christian questions in the midst of atheistic trouble. Second, everybody's sad, and they're weeping and crying over the people that have lost. I think that's a good response. However, why are we weeping and crying over the loss of life? Because we believe down inside that life is sacred, that it has intrinsic value. But if you are the result of time plus matter plus chance and atheistic evolution, there's no value or intrinsic worth to your life. And you're just one group of chemicals annihilating another group of chemicals. You understand? So the questions we ask in pain and suffering are questions of theism, not atheism. And third, what I thought was really interesting is the press actually used the word evil. Hold on a minute. You can't borrow a Christian word <laughs> to answer your atheistic questions. Because we tell people in a secular humanistic society that right and wrong is left up to every individual. You determine for yourself what is right and what is wrong. If that's true, then who are you to tell a gunman who goes into a mosque and murders 50 people that what he did was wrong? 
I thought right and wrong is left up to the individual. You're undermining your own mind. It proves that you believe in categoric good and evil. But you can only have categoric absolute good and evil if you have a categoric absolute moral law to define those categories. And you can't have that without God. As soon as you use the word evil, you are assuming that there are objective moral values that we are all held accountable to and for. But New Zealand has attached itself to an atheistic mooring so that when the storms come and the ship is broken apart, they're tossed on a sea without compass or sail. They have no answers. That's why John Campbell says, what will save us? If we can't save ourselves by creating this perfect society, then what will save us from tragedies like this? The atheistic worldview cannot even justify its questions. Do you know what I mean by that? The atheistic worldview cannot even justify its questions. You can't ask why if there's no God, because there is no why. You shouldn't be sad at loss of life because life is not sacred. It's just chemicals covered by another group. And you can't categorize something as evil because there's no such thing as absolute evil. However, in the midst of these tragedies, how do we Christ followers respond to this? Because somebody said this to me, okay, Jeff, well, if this is a theistic worldview, then your God is either uncaring, lazy, or weak. That's a fair question, isn't it? If, it is, if God does exist, then he's either uncaring, he doesn't care about stuff like this, or he's lazy, he just has, he's too busy doing other things, sitting on the couch eating potato chip, watching football, or, or he's just weak, he's unable to do anything about it. And again, this is where the Christian scriptures remind us of, of three valuable truths. Number one, we're told that first, although God does not prevent every act of evil, there are times when God does say this far and no further. There's much in human history suggest that there have been times when God has said, no, enough is enough. Regimes of the past which seemed invincible suffered traumatic ends at just the right time when they were on the verge of total domination. Hitler and the Third Reich is an example of this. You say, well, if I were God, I would have stopped it a lot sooner. Well, that's the whole point, though. You're not God. And I mentioned this on the airways down in New Zealand, that perhaps the fact that New Zealand is not a German territory or a Japanese colony attests to divine intervention more than we want to admit. There are example after example of great leaders. I'm not putting words in their mouths now. Great leaders who would say, God intervened in history. A matter of fact, there's a great book that you must read. Now, have you ever heard me say that? There's a, I've, I've said, hey, there's a great book. You should get a copy. No, there is a great book. As an American, every American ought to read it. It's called The American Miracle, other than the Bible now. The American Miracle, Divine Providence and the Rise of the Republic by Michael Medved. And it is the history of the United States. And it's a book about this thick that traces the uncanny pattern of the intervention of God all the way from the first settlers to George Washington, even right up to today. It shows you how history could have turned a different way. We would have been a different nation, a different state. It is uncanny. When I first picked it up, I thought, I'm not reading this book because you can interpret history any way you want to, but you've got to read the book. It's objective. It doesn't slant history. It just simply, simply presents it to you for you to make your own decision. It is uncanny to see the pattern of God's involvement in this country. And I know people in other countries think that we're arrogant as Americans, but perhaps the reason our country is so affluent, perhaps the reason that we are filled with wealth, probably one-sixth of the world's wealth, is because the foundation upon which our country was built. But think about it just for a second. The trouble with the, all the things that God prevents is that you will never know God prevented them. Because if he didn't prevent them, you would have seen them. So you have no idea of knowing how many times God does prevent something in your life. You only know the things that do come in. And the scripture says that to walk by faith is to trust that God knows what he's doing. And I used to say that all the time, but I've begun to realize as I've gotten older, that's only a half truth, really. Because you can look in the annals of history and listen to the voice of leaders. I mean, I had so many examples, but because of time, I can only give you two. The leader of the Russian army 
was on his face in St. Petersburg at a church that still stands today praying that God would spare the world from the armies of Napoleon. God intervened by sending a minor, minor prophet called the winter. Had, listen, had the weather been different, history would look totally different. The Russian army was spared. The Tsar became a Christ follower. Napoleon was defeated. Those are words of a leader. We have a lot of Filipinos around Los Angeles, in and around Los Angeles. The history of the Filipino people records the fact that General Honesto Isleta, as uh, President Fernand Marcos Air Force was descending on these 800 freedom fighters to totally destroy these men with all this weaponry, Honesto Isleta took out his Bible and began to pray and read Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. As he began to read this over and over and over, for some reason, one by one, the pilots defected, the army was saved, and God, in the words of General Isleta, said, had secured our freedom. Things were changed. Now, these aren't my words. Leader after leader after leader. In fact, I remember reading uh, that uh, one of our own generals, as the war was beginning, began to pray that God would spare life, that God would cause war to stop, to cease. But these events that we can recount again and again, they do seem to be the exceptions, at least in our eyes, not the rule. Because here's how we think. Man, if I were God, I would have stopped these events from occurring. And the problem is, you're not God. And you're severely limited in knowledge and wisdom. And just because you can't see a good reason why God allows something to happen does not mean that a good reason does not exist. It just means you can't see it. But you can't see it because you're finite. We are limited in our knowledge. Limited. And there comes a time you have to admit your own limitations. Now, second, we also fail to recognize that if God were to remove, and I know this is a broken record, but I'm going to say it until you get it, until you can repeat it, if God were to remove every potential act of evil, you and I would have to go. As long as God gives you the freedom to reject or to follow him, many are going to use that freedom for their own self-aggrandizement. 99.9% .9 of the world's pain and suffering comes as a result of what we do to each other, right? It's what we do to each other. Robin and I lived in Zimbabwe for 10 years before we lived in New Zealand. And while New Zealand is suffering their tragedy, Zimbabwe is still today suffering theirs. Why is Zimbabwe suffering still today? Why is there starvation and infant death and politically motivated genocide and euthanasia by an older generation that's lost hope? Why? When you've got a country that is so rich in resources, they could feed the country 10 times over. They just discovered a few years ago a seven mile wide and seven mile long diamond mine. There as well. So why are the people starving? This is a result of extreme levels of corruption and narcissism among generations of political leaders and self-aggrandizing legislation. God is no more to blame for starvation and corruption in Zimbabwe as he is for some, some crazed gunman walking into a mosque in New Zealand and mowing down 50 people. Jesus taught us that the evidence that a culture loves God is that it loves all of its people. And when we stop loving and pursuing God, we stop loving and pursuing each other. Amen. And after 9-11, when Americans stood in churches and said, why God? I think God was looking down and saying, no, why you? Why do you use your freedom that I've given you to pursue a relationship with me to wreak havoc on each other? And the problem is that if you want God to remove every potential evil in this world, then you can't be here. Everybody's got to go. Now, I know that still doesn't answer the question of why God seems to often sit on his hands while atrocities run rampant in his world. Free will and love play huge parts in that and what theologians call or refer to as God's permissive will. But why does God prevent others and allow others? And the answer to that, of course, is I don't know because I'm not God. But here's what I do know. Just because there are things we do not know does not change the things we do know. And that's this, the number one recognized symbol in the world is the cross. 
And the cross speaks two powerful messages. Number one, it reminds you that you can be in the worst season of your life and be directly in the center of the will of God at the same time. When was Jesus most centered in the will of his Father? When he was dying on the cross. And God took that and saved all mankind. So it's possible that God saves you in the midst of the worst situation of your life. And second, God is able to take the worst atrocity ever committed to man. That is the death of his son. A man who lived a perfect life and showed nothing but compassion. And the world killed him. And yet God took that and used it for the ultimate good, the salvation of mankind. But to remove every potential evil in this world would be to create a robotic world. And in a robotic world, you would have no such thing as love and grace and mercy and forgiveness because they would all be manipulated. They would lose their integrity. They would not be real. And so God moves and waits. He moves, working everything together for his good, and he waits because one day every single one of us is going to stand before God and give an account for the manner in which we've used our freedom. You're free but you're going to give an account for the way in which you've lived your life. Yeah, but Jeff, I I know that, but I still struggle because God could have prevented this tragedy in New Zealand. I mean, after all, after all, if I'm walking by a, a lake and I see somebody drowning and I don't go in and save them, that's wrong, right? Well, then why is it not wrong for God to be walking by a situation knowing he could stop it and refuse to stop it? And of course, the answer to that is, is because God is the giver of life And because God can restore anything that's been lost, you can't. And the Bible says that because God owns us, he uses us for his purposes. But that's okay. Because the life you get the second time around is far more glorious than the one you lost. That's what Easter is really all about, folks. That's why we read 1 Corinthians 15. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. What's the point? Paul is saying, which is more beautiful, a seed or the whole apple tree? Do you see what he's saying? It's far more glorious to have a beautiful apple tree than the seed. When you die, you're just a seed, but the body that will be is far more glorious than the seed that went into the ground. And so because God can, is the giver of life and can restore all life, he has the right to determine what he stops, what he prevents, what he allows, if by God in his infinite wisdom, he brings everything about for the restoration of mankind. And that's why the Bible says we mourn, but not as a people who have no hope. We have ultimate hope. And that's why over the last few years, I've been reading this page from C.S. Lewis on the last page of the Chronicles of Narnia, where C.S. Lewis says, when we lose somebody that we love, for us, it's the end of the story. But he says, but for them, it's only the beginning of the real story. I love that. Death is the beginning of the real story, your real life. All of your life in this world, it's only a cover page or a title page. And now at last, you're beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and in which every chapter is better than the one before. Why am I reading that so often? I think because I'm getting older now. (laughs) It's amazing what you like to read when you get older. And I think it's the reality of death. Because the reality is none of you have any guarantees, and I don't either, and I'm starting to realize that. You know, people my age are dying. When that happens, it does something to you. See, when you're younger, people die, but they're old people. They're supposed to. That's how you think. And then when you're 54... You keep getting these notes how somebody you went to high school with died. Somebody younger than you died, heart attack, stroke. And then you start to realize your own immortality or mortality. You know, I was away for an extended period of time on this last trip, and we were, it was a tiring trip. But I really missed my wife. She didn't travel with me. And I really missed her. And I started thinking, you know, I, I've noticed the older I get, the more I miss her. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's dawned on me that the day will come when she will go. Or me. It'll probably be me. <laughs> and if, like I said, if it's me, don't believe the suicide note. <laughs> and find my head chopped up in the freezer. <laughs> seriously, though, Seriously. So the day is going to come when uh, we're not together. I, as you get older, you realize, 
man, I'm not sure I could live without my wife. Now, as you get older, you make your peace with that. And I think the only way that I could survive without her is to know that the great story for her has just begun. And so I think I read things like that more and more because just to remind myself that my hope is not here. And I think Peter forgot that just for a moment when he pulled out his dagger, that his hope and his citizenship and his future is in heaven. And I think when we experience tragedy, we also are shocked and we forget this world is broken and none of us has any guarantees that somebody won't walk in that door one day and mow us all down. And so with that, the Bible says one of Jesus' companions, that's Peter, draws his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And then Jesus says, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jesus is saying to Peter, what are you doing, man? You know your hope is not in this world. My kingdom's not in this world. If it were in this world, I'd call the legions of angels. We'd take care of business. It's not about this place. Don't be a fool. Tonight, your life may be required of you, Jesus told a rich young ruler. So can I ask you which kingdom you're protecting and progressing? I mean, really? Whose kingdom are you building in your life, really? Your own or the kingdom of God? The best of you, does it go to your self-sustainment or self-aggrandizing, or does it really go, the best of you go to the building of the kingdom of God? Now, I want you to take these things, and I want you to set them over here for a moment. I'm getting ready to enter a very difficult part of the message. I'm going to place it over here, and then we'll bring them both back together. But I need you to kind of take a deep breath and make sure you've got enough oxygen in your brain. Because you cannot misunderstand what I'm saying, and I ask you to let me finish it. Let me finish before you make any judgments. What I've just shared with you is a major difference the major difference between Jesus and Islam. Islam, at its core, is a religion of violence. Now, stay with me. I have studied this for over 30 years. The Quran is very clear. Kill the unbeliever until all the world is Islam. And a major, a major value in Islam Islam is deception. In other words, if I can deceive you in thinking that I'm not going to harm you and harm you, that's a value. Now, that does not mean that every Muslim is violent. Well, that's ridiculous. That's like saying every Christian is devout. Robin and I had strong Muslim neighbors next door to us in New Zealand. They were our closest friends. They were nominal Muslims. They were peaceful Muslims but they were also nominal. There are many nominal Christians. Some of you are. You just haven't made your peace with that yet. And you shouldn't. You're a Christian in name only. You're not really serious about following the Bible or Jesus. When's the last time? I mean, it's been so long since you even read a verse out of Scripture. And there's very little effort in your life of pursuing Christ's likeness. You are a nominal Christian. There are people who are Nominal Muslims. And much of Islam today is peaceful, about 28% of it. I'll show you where I get that in a moment. I'm simply saying that at its core belief, Islam is not satisfied until people convert or die. Christianity is very different here. Its God is loving and sacrificial. Yahweh, Jehovah, is a personal God of relationship. And his whole story, history, is about the redemption of mankind so that God doesn't want anybody, anybody to perish until they come to the knowledge of Jesus. Which is why a Christian would never harm anybody of any other faith. Because in the Christian scheme of things, you want people to live a long life so that they will have the opportunity at some point to be introduced to a Jesus who loves them and saves them. You would never want to harm anyone who doesn't agree with your particular religious view. Your heart becomes the heart of God. You want all men to repent and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The point is, when you engage in terrorism, if you are a devout 
Muslim, you do so in agreement with the central tenets of Islam. You are following the order of your master. That's why when the tragedy of 9-11 occurred, you didn't hear that much from the Islamic world. Even the moderates were silent. In some cases, there was celebration for what had happened. I am pleased with the Christians in New Zealand who travel to Christchurch to surround their Muslim friends with love and compassion. That is the right thing to do. That's what a Christian does, man. There were sons and daughters and husbands and wives and grandfathers and grandmothers. They were mourning. We should mourn with them. We should hurt with them if we are compassionate. But here's something that is seldom talked about. And I'm afraid too many of us pastors are afraid to mention it. Where is New Zealand's prime minister's voice? When trends show us today that in Africa and Asia and the Middle East, they are intensifying their persecutions against the Christian. Every single day, there are unjust imprisonments, harassment, beatings and torture and death. Every single month, Every single month, 255 plus Christians are killed, 104 are abducted, 180 Christian women are raped, sexually assaulted, and harassed, 66 churches on average are attacked and burned down, 160 Christians are detained without trial and in prison. In 2018 alone, 3,066 Christians were killed just because they were Christ followers. 1,020 were raped and sexually assaulted, 793 churches were attacked and burned down. These persecutions were fueled by Islamic oppression. People are tortured every day in this world simply for being Christ followers. There are 44 countries in the world that are predominantly Muslim with a population of over 1.1 billion. 44 countries, 1.1 billion. 72% of the world's Muslims all live in these countries. Okay? 44 countries. In their midst live about 56 million Christians. So the question is, how do these Muslim states treat the 56 million Christians when the Christians live in their countries? And here's the answer. They are refused treatment at hospitals. They are constantly displaced, removed from territory that they rightfully own. Christians are not allowed to share their faith. It is illegal to talk about Jesus. Christians cannot build church buildings. In the cases where they are allowed to, it has to be no less than a mile away from a mosque. It has to be smaller than a mosque. When they come into a country or come to Christ, they face honor killings. No foreign missionaries are allowed to live inside their countries. There's a failure to prosecute crimes against Christians. So if you commit a crime against a Christian, you'll get away with it. There's mob violence. Restrictions on marriage, there are blasphemy laws. Homosexuals and lesbians are killed. CNN just released a report in Brunei. Legislation has just passed where if you are a gay or a lesbian, you are to be stoned to death. Women are especially tortured, must be accompanied to public places as banks and social departments by men. They're not allowed to go out on their own. And there is little to no religious freedom. Now, here's what's so amazing. You say, well, Pastor Jeff, I'm a little uncomfortable with this. This sounds like hate speech to me. No, this is truth speech. Truth speech. Because I'm not telling you to hate as a result. I'm telling you that you should hate no one. I'm simply telling you that you've got to stand up for the Christ follower who's being killed every day in our world. Every day. Countries are willing to stand up. And outcry and show compassion. And that is the right thing to do for these people who have lost lives. But what about the thousands and thousands of Christians? Nobody is giving them a voice. When Muslims move and live in countries that were once Christian, here's what's amazing. So if Christians live in their countries, 72%, 44 countries, 1.1 billion. But when Muslims move to Christian countries, guess what? They're given religious freedom. The New Zealand Prime Minister actually had a moment of silence and a, cause to mo- and a call to Muslim prayers over all the national radio stations, which is something that would never happen in a country of Islam, Christian prayers over the media network. Mosques are encouraged, sometimes even given special permits in a Christian country. Crimes or languages against Muslims sometimes is called hate speech and carries with it penalties. 
Muslims are allowed to stand on the street and preach. I, again, I happen to agree with. Imagine, in Christian nations, Muslims can run for political office and can even become president. Again, I happen to agree in a democracy. I'm simply saying, I'm simply saying the facts show you that Islam and Christianity are very different. When you take up violence in Islam, you are adhering to the central tenets of the core values of Islam. Doesn't mean everybody, doesn't mean every person who's in Islam is, is not peaceful. There's plenty of peaceful Muslims. You understand what I'm saying? But the core central tenet of the Quran is convert or die to make the whole world Islam, where the central tenet of Jesus is that conversion does not happen by force, but by the inner will and freedom of every man and woman. Which is why Jesus said in Matthew 26, Peter, put your sword back in its place. What are you doing? For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And then Pilate summons Jesus. And he says, Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, is that your own idea? Somebody else tell you that. Am I a Jew? Replied Pilate. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus said from day one, you don't take my kingdom by force. My kingdom is not of this world. Christianity is not a state religion. It's in the heart and mind of every believer. And that's why our call is to love and to serve and to rescue all people. And please don't misunderstand what I've said. You are to love every Muslim with compassion and mercy and grace and hopefully an open dialogue that is cordial. But I just simply wish that the world would acknowledge the persecution of Christians that is going on among these 1.1 billion Islamic states. Who will cry out for them? And so here's my challenge to you. First, let us bear the burdens of our Muslim friends. Pray for those who lost lives in Christ church. I'm so proud of the Christians who are going down and praying and comforting and mourning with them. So proud of the Christians who are going down to Christ church and saying, hey, we may differ in our religious views, but you're my brother, you're my sister. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here for you to pray for you. And to... I mean, they're taking up collections. I love what the Christians are doing. They are, in some parts, they are funding funerals. They are bringing food. It's, it's captivating. Second, let us never forget that each of us has the power to bless each other or to curse each other. How about let's be about blessing? Let's put aside our differences and allow love to be the highest value. Let us never approve or condone violence against any faith system contrary to ours. If Christianity can't stand up in dialogue, then it shouldn't stand at all. Third, let us allow this tragedy to remind us that the truth that God would never cause such an event but he is indeed able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. The cross shows us that God stood by and allowed a great atrocity to occur so that those who were far from God could come near. But you know what the real message is? This is the end of the sermon. You know what the real message of Matthew 26 is? Number one, evil is real. Evil is real. There are two entities diametrically opposed to one another. But here's the thing. The same evil that possesses a man to go into a mosque and murder 50 people is the same evil entity that is distracting you with affluence to take your mind off the kingdom of God and get you sucked into things that are temporary at best. It's the same entity. It's the same entity that moves into your life and tells you a lie and robs you of your ultimate joy. It's the same entity that distracts you away from the kingdom of God into the kingdom of the world and leaves you empty. The enemy masquerades as an enemy or a, as an angel of light. It looks good on the outside, disintegrates you on the inside. And the closer you are to God, the more you recognize the enemy. The further away you are, the more you cannot see him. 
Evil is real. Second, death is real. Nobody in this room has guarantee of how long you're going to live. You just don't. You could be mown down in a church building or as you cross the street, a heart attack, a stroke. The, the important question is not how long am I going to live? The important question is are you ready to die? Do you know the one who will escort you into a life? The difference between the seed and the beautiful glorious apple tree where everything that you lost, God replaces to an infinitely greater degree. Death is real. It's going to happen. Three, but so is Jesus. He's real. And his kingdom is unshakable. It lasts forever. Why would you put your faith and all of your hope in what is in the here and now when it is dying and in decay just like you are? And the fourth thing, your decision is real. You decide. And it's real. So which kingdom are you really part of? Come on now. This is the end of the sermon, so think about this for a moment. Which kingdom are you really a citizen of? Really? Well, how do I know, Pastor Jeff? Well, let me give you this example. Let's say, any Laker fans, any, any pathetic Laker fans in here, right? <laughs> let's say, let's say uh, you're a Laker fan. Let's say you love the Lakers, and I, I see you out in, the, out in the town, and you've got a Laker jersey on. And I woke up to you, and you look pretty fit and young. And I said, man, are you a Laker? And you say, yeah, I'm a Laker. I say, really? What time is practice? You say, well, I don't really go to practice much. I, I only go when I feel like it. What role do you play on the team? Oh, mostly I just watch. What sacrifices is, are, are required to be on the team? Oh, I, I, I basically just sit on my couch and eat potato chips and watch the games. Have you won any championships? Yeah, we've won many championships, and, and I celebrate every time with the team, every time we win a championship. So what you're saying is you don't go to the practices. You've never played in a game. You've, you, you've played not, not a real role in their success. You've sacrificed very little, and the totality of your involvement is celebrating when the victories come. You're not a Laker. You're a Laker fan. You're not a follower of Jesus. You're a fan of Jesus. You think he's pretty cool, but you're not directly involved in the battle. You're not using your gifts to expand the kingdom of God. And if you do give anything, it's whatever's left over of your time, your talents, and your resources. And to tell you the truth, you're not that real serious about following Jesus, so you seldom open the word. There's no devotional life, no prayer life, because the affluence of the West has sucked you out of commitment into living your life for something that is dying. Now, here's what I know. Jesus makes all the difference in this world. Has he made a difference in your life? And you know the answer to that because over the last 10 minutes as I've been talking, the Spirit of God told you. And the question is, are you going to do something about it because you know you're not? Or are you just going to keep going the way you are? And Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? And Jesus said, I don't even know who you are. Where are you? You know, I want to do something this weekend I never get a chance to do. I'm going to ask everybody on every campus, Lone Hill, Etiwanda, right here. Would everybody just close their eyes for a minute, please? Everybody, nobody looking up, everybody's eyes closed. When you hear a sermon like this sometimes, uh, the Spirit of God will stir something in you. If you're in this room and the Spirit of God, or if you're in uh, the room here at Atawanda or here at Lone Hill, and suddenly it's dawned on you that you, you've not been walking with God for so long, just going through the motions, but there's no real change, there's no real transformation, there's no real heart or passion then some of you who've been away need to come back home. This is the season to do it. Easter's on the way. Some of you need to come back home. Others of you on all of our campus, others of you have never really given your life to Jesus, and you know it. Now, what you did, you did say, hey, Jesus is out on the cross. I'll take that for my sins, but you never made him the Lord of your life. You have never truly, never truly, and only you know this, said, God, here is my life. I give it to you. In fact, this whole Christian stuff really kind of bores you. 
You kind of only come to church because it's the thing to do, but there's real no transformation in your life yet. And it's because you're still on the outside looking in. Some of you need to come to Jesus for the first time in your life and say, you know what, I've I played this game all my life, but I, I'm, I'm truly going to come today and give my life to you. Now on all campuses, eyes closed, if you're the kind of person that knows you're not where you ought to be with God, that you've never truly given your life to Jesus Christ, I'm, you, uh, given your life to Jesus, I didn't say you hadn't prayed a prayer, but you never have given your life to Jesus, then I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. Silently, don't pray it out loud. Repeat it with me. Father, I acknowledge that you are the giver of life. I acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from you. I acknowledge that evil is real and tries to distract me from what is good. I acknowledge that death is real and one day I will stand before you and give an account for my life. I acknowledge that Jesus is real and will forgive me of my sin. I acknowledge that my decision is real and today I decide to give my heart to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. On every campus, Etiwanda, let's do you first. Etiwanda, if you prayed that prayer, raise your hand right now. Raise your hand so that our campus pastors can get a good look. If you're at San Dimas, would you raise your hand? If you prayed that prayer right now, just raise your hand. Nobody's watching. Everybody's got their head down. I'm Okay, I see you. I see you on the left and in the center. And on the right, thank you. All right, at Lone Hill, raise your hand. If you prayed that prayer, hopefully there's one or two of you that have prayed that prayer, maybe even more. Raise your hand so our campus pastor can see you. Good. All right, every head up. I pray, I pray that we would take this far more seriously than we ever have. So that if God ever called us to give our lives for the sake of the gospel, that we would. That we would. Let's just celebrate kind of what just happened on our campus. Can you celebrate? <laughs> Father, thank you for today. We pray your blessings. We pray for insight. And we celebrate lives transformed in Christ's name. Thank you for joining us. We really hope God spoke to you, but we don't want this conversation to end here. We wanna continue this conversation with you throughout the week. That's why we have our online Facebook group, CCV Online Campus. You can join today, invite your friends to join, and we'll continue this conversation with you. I hope to connect with you really soon.